Yes, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, I'm really uh, happy to be here and, uh, well, uh, explain more and uh, use the aviation as a, a comparison to the uh, whole security and software development. Um, so, yeah, survival is not mandatory and, yeah, the Air Force One has departed and are you on board? So later on, in the end, we will come back to this question and, um, yeah, dive into it. So, um, let's see. Who am I? I'm Glenn Tenkater. I'm a security dude at Schubert Phyllis. I'm also the author, together with my brother, of the OWASP uh, Security Knowledge Framework. Uh, well, here are some coordinates if you want to contact or have questions. So, um, yeah, I, I want to start with airplanes. I, I mean, I, I, I'm personally really scared when I first went into an airplane. I mean, you give out the control. Um, but again, it is really a false mean of traveling, right? It's, it's, it also is really cool. It's using the, the latest technology. It has autopilots, a lot of cool technology in there, um, monitoring, um, communication. And yeah, in my opinion, they are very reliable. Um, like if you take a, b a bike or uh, go walking, uh, there's a higher chance you, you would die, right? Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah. I want to dive into the whole aviation and airplanes and to see how they handle, well, problems, how they deal with uh, risk. Um, and I think it was a really good uh, uh, comparison to the whole software uh, development uh, part and security. Um, so in the uh, airplane uh, aviation world, you have a lot of training, of course. Training is essential when creating new pilots and, you know, teach them all the, all the things. And as you can see, they have to know a lot of things before they even can start, right? The, the uh, instrumentations, the automation, the, all the stuff. So training takes a long time and it's really a, a profession, right? It is part of the whole, uh, yeah, not the development cycle, but the whole cycle of the aviation and getting uh, pilots to learn the experience and the things they should know. Um, so, and the other thing is checklists. They use a lot of checklists. Before they land, before they go, they check everything. Because, yeah, you don't want to have an airplane drop out of the sky or lose the airplane that it costs billions of dollars. And, oh yeah, there's also uh, people in there. So, hey, um, <laughs> let's check, check, check. So checklists are really important for the aviation and the air pilots. Um, also, you have a lot of manuals. I mean, when there is a critical uh, situation, they can grab the manual, go to the specific point in there, and have some guidance on the issue, how to solve it. If an engine fails, what is the next procedure? What should we do, right? So also, manuals are a part of the whole flow of the aviation. Uh, very important. Then, of course, you have testing. They test everything in very in-depth uh, views, right? They really check, like, tubes, what the, the, is the diameter of it, how strong is it, well, how many bars it can resist, right? Um, so all the, the, the parts of the airplane are really tested in-depth. Like you see here in the, in the picture, here you see um, they, they pump water into the engine. Because, yeah, there is a use case when you're in the sky and there's a big storm, uh, the engine shouldn't, you know, <laughs> drop out or fail or go off because of the, the amount of water being pumped into the engine. So in here, you see it being tested properly to see it and if it's handled correctly. Um, so they, they do a lot of testing, like the cri critical individual uh, components, uh, certain conditions that are really rare, right? Uh, manual testing, of course, and in here you see, well, automatically testing. So testing of all the stuff, all the components, and how they work together are really important. Um, also, I think this is a very important part, sharing information. So the airline companies, when they found something, and that's really an issue, like possible to let the airplane crash or, you know, they, they immediately send this information around also to the other aviation uh, and airplane manufacturing to see if this problem also is in there, right? They really have a close connection together and, yeah, learn from their mistakes and trying to share this knowledge to the other ones so, yeah, they can keep their uh, assets safe and keep our lives safe, right? Not letting the plane crash. So 
in the end, I see this as uh, all, all this is for the good of protecting us, for protecting the airplanes, protecting the people. Um, and I really like this idea, this, this open-mindedness towards each other, helping, because, yeah, it, it's a win-win for everybody if the airplane keeps in the air, right? Um, so now I want to make the step to the software development world. Um, so I want to start with how important it is to do security. I mean, last year, this year, um, around 45 million web applications got hacked. And these are only the, static, uh, the metrics we know of, right? So 45 million that uh, were open about it, like, hey, we got hacked. So we don't even see the rest that didn't got uh, reported, right? So um, also, a lot of sensitive information is leaked, uh, well, correlated to the airplane uh, industry. Lives of people are at risk. And um, yeah, also, criminals get really better in IT and, and hack, you know, and I see IT is still behind. So yeah, the, the, the title says it, those who fail to learn from history are forced to repeat the past. And well, it's uh, obvious. <laughs> A loop uh, in the image, so yeah, we have to learn, we have to adopt, we have to share knowledge like the aviation industry is doing. So then I come to the point where the sharing knowledge, the sharing knowledge I see is in the software security world, OWASP. OWASP, Jim already uh, mentioned it a little bit, is the open uh, web application security profit, worldwide non-profit charitable organization, really focused on proving security, helping developers, helping the world to do security right. Um, so it is really a knowledge sharing platform slash network for everybody is interested in doing security proper and, and you know, want to have guidance with it. Um, so, Again, I like the OWASP, it is like doing the aviation part, sharing the knowledge. It is a win-win situation for everybody. Um, also, OWASP use checklists, like we see in the aviation industry. So OWASP has the application security verification standard. That's a worldwide used checklist. It is already like uh, five, six years old. We're now at the revision of 3.0. Uh, that is, that is going to be released like Yesterday. yesterday, wow, okay, so yesterday the new version of the ISVS checklist came out. Uh, like I said, it is really worldwide al already accepted, um, and it's all about securing web applications in depth. Um, yeah, of course, you can visit OWASP for more information. Um, so, what is the uh, ISVS? It is the verification standard. Um, and not only that, you can also use it as a security requirement. Depending on what type of application you want to defend, you can say, okay, the security requirement can be a level one for really easy, simple web applications, or a level three for really critical applications. And depending on what level you choose, the different type of security controls will be in there. Um, so, what does it mean if you don't have security requirements? Well, in my honest opinion, it can only lead to one thing. In this case, in the aviation, it, it, you know, an airplane can crash, right? I mean, the only question is when. If we don't deal with security and we don't have security requirements, this is reality. People lives are at risk. So, now to the good part. Training. Also, OWASP has a lot of training capabilities. Um, like I said, I am uh, the author of the Security Knowledge Framework. It is really a tool intended to help and guide developers and train them. It is uh, fully open. Um, it is all about creating web applications, security by design. Um, we also make use of the ASVS as the post-development stage. Um, and again, you know, also we, we try to map and learn from the aviation. I mean, I have a really safe, good feeling when I get into an airplane and I know it, you know, I get there. I get from A to Z and I, I land safely. So training in here is also very important. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the security knowledge framework. So uh, in the security knowledge framework, we have uh, multiple core 
functionality, um, like the pre-development phase, post-development phase, the security knowledge framework as a reference for looking up things, because uh, what we found out when you are in desperate and you want to have some guidance on specific how to do or implement certain type of functionality, it is still hard to uh, found, find a really good place where there's an authority and you can trust or, you know, it's validated what you look there. And it was really hard because, um, well, take for example cross-site request forgery. Uh, if you Google it, you get tons of examples, and of those tons of examples, only like three or four are really good. They're really security by design, thought about it, they didn't miss any implementation errors, you know, they, they thought of it very well. But if you were unlucky and you choose one or the others, yeah, then you had you you implemented a weak cross-site request forgery. So the security knowledge framework want to address this issue. They want to you know create a global place where you can look up the information, get guidance, and also is a place of authority, right? Because it's transparent, it's open source. Everybody can review, edit, or make uh, you know contributions to it. Um, and we also have the security code examples. Um, the, those are really intended to help the developer on a really implementation level. And the code examples are not meant to copy-paste. It are all about getting the right mindset to empower the developer to create defensible web applications that are really secure by design. Um, and with the security code examples, we try to give more guidance in depth about the whole mindset uh, that a developer sh should have, right? Um, so now I want to uh, uh, have a, a small overview and a, a look at the security knowledge framework itself. Uh, the security knowledge framework is basically a web application that you can um, run in on your local machine if you want, want that. Um, you can also spin it up as a service inside your company and use it like that. Um, so let me swap here. <coughs> That's uh, the open demo, so everybody can have a look, everybody can inject. Uh, we, we also have that, so if somebody now tries to inject the application, it will go lockdown mode, <laughs> so please don't. <laughs> um, so basically, this is the landing page of the security knowledge framework. This application you can also run, like I said before, as a service or local on the, on the machine of the developer. Um, this is the landing page. Um, and as you can see, we have a, a certain type of things. So I will want to start with the knowledge base. The knowledge base is basically what all the other things are built around it. So the knowledge base are like almost more than 200 items that you should take into consideration or implement in your, well, maybe critical web application. So as you can see here, it's very uh, extensive and a really big list. So if you have a critical web application, and you know that really is uh, critical, you should implement all those checklist items. But have a look how many it are. So um, again, so the whole idea of the knowledge base is to have a central place of reference where you can look something up. So in here, you can just say, I want to know something about uploading. And then you get the file upload injections. So the knowledge base is basically explaining what the attack factor is of this item. So what can an attacker do when you have file upload injections? And as you can see, we don't bother uh, showing how the developer can hack or do this. No, we were just creating awareness and a mindset. Um, also, after that one, what, when we show what the attack factor is, we also have a solution. And in the solution, we, we want to guide the developer and tell him what are all the possibilities to really mitigate and you know, stop this in type of uh, attack factor. Um, these knowledge base items are then also used in the pre-development phase and the post-development phase, but I will show you that in a bit. Um, then we have, like I said before, uh, the code examples. We do have like uh, PHP and .NET examples. We are working on the Python and Java examples. Um, and in here, we can have, again, uh, a more in-depth view and how to approach this type of functionality. 
So, for example, this uh, code example is about PHP file upload. A PHP file upload can be done in like three, four lines of code. Then you have the functionality, then you have the file upload. But if you don't properly build this functionality, <coughs> an attacker can easily own your server by uploading his own code, run it, execute it, and yeah, you pwn the server. Um, so in here, we have the code examples where we really want to guide the developer on an implementation level and create the right mindset to how to approach this. So for example, in here, we, we start the validation class. We start the logging class. Then we check the image. We select the upload there. Then we have, well, we tell about what do we check. So we do an input validation. And again, input validation is really important. Um, because the, those metrics we can use later on in the application to make the application make decisions, do proactive countermeasurements, or all that type of stuff. Um, then we continue after the validation, then we do and handle the whole functionality, but before we do that, we're going to lock that we're going to do this. So sometimes you have an application that does an action, and it does the action, and after the action it does the lock, the logging the, the, the action, but what would happen if the attacker did a successful attack? Then it probably never reached the logging functionality and you wouldn't know that there's something wrong or somebody tried to attack you. Um, so also in here we have, I don't know, it's very visible, but so the comment says, set a counter. If counter hits three, the user session must be terminated. After three session terminations, the user account should be blocked since the high threat level will lead to immediately session termination. So when you have really critical functionality, you really want to punish that user. You want to use the validation, the log, increase the counter, and say, no, if you are doing bad stuff, move. So here, this is a good example how you can use your logging and the, the audits to prevent and do proactive countermeasurements. Um, well, then we go further. Um, we do a location. If the check's not correct, we do the upload. Uh, you do the type checking. Um, when it's successful, we lock that also, right? Um, and then we continue. So as you can see, it's really about uh, getting the right mindset and how a developer should approach it. Um, yeah, and like I said before, we also have it for .NET. Um, so also here you can have a look, file upload. Um, so yeah, basically that are the, the reference part, right? If you want to have a specific a question or want to have a on the spot information about a certain subject, you can use the knowledge base or the code examples to look it up. Um, but that's not the only thing the security knowledge framework is for. We also have the ability to create projects. Um, and in this project, you can see, I already created one. Um, we have the ability to use the pre-development functionality or the post-development functionality. Uh, the pre-development functionality, that is basically what a developer uh, would use when he is in the sprint or when he is thinking about use cases. So you have to develop new type of functionality. And in here, you can put it into it. So even before you write a single line of code, you get awareness by using the pre-development tool. So, for example, I can say here, I'm going to work on like Sprint 2, and I'm going to add uh, upload functionality. So now I can select multiple types of function. And basically, this is the technology stacks or the functionality a developer is, you know, common and it's often being used. So in here, I can say, well, we're going to do something with forms. We're going to do something with the upload. Um, let's see where it is. Yeah, file upload. Well, we are uploading, so maybe it's also nice to do the file download. So now we can add those type of technologies and functionality to this uh, pre-development phase. And now we can say, okay, this is the type of functionality we want to deliver for the next uh, release. Then we can click here to do and view the results. So what happened now is the security knowledge framework made a cor correlation with this type of functionality to the knowledge base item in the security knowledge framework. So for example, the file upload, what, what type of attack factors do you have there? Well, the file upload injections. And again, you see the whole knowledge base item in here. 
So before the developer starts writing code, he is already aware of the attack vectors that are lurking around the corner for him. Um, so for the file download, you have the refle reflective download and the file download injections. Same for forms, you have a sort of pattern. You cannot only do and say like, oh yeah, you have to do this for a form. No, there are multiple things you have to do to make really a good form and submission. For example, simple uh, single user input validation controls and audit loss. You have to get your cross-site request forgery tokens up into spec, uh, the principle of lost privileges. And you have to use get slash post. So if you are doing data mutations, you have to do it always by post requests. A good example of the OAuth, they are using GET, so everything is, is leaked in the browser, in the log, uh, et cetera. So these are all type of things a developer should take into consideration. Um, and I, like I said, uh, it's, it's telling him up front. So even before he writes a single line of code, he gets this feedback. Um, he can also download the report uh, as a docx, where all this information is in, and share it among his colleagues or uh, team. Um, so basically, he, the developer has this feedback, he, he goes and built uh, the functionality that was desired. Uh, when he created the functionality he wanted, then we got in the uh, post-development phase. The post-development phase is the, the place where we created all the code and we want to do the verification if it's all implemented correctly. Um, and for that we are using I hope it's still readable. Uh, we are using the ASVS, the OWASP Application Security Verification Standard. Um, we do have a, a split it up into level one. Uh, level one is very nice if you want to start. You don't doing any security yet. I would recommend start with level one. Uh, but for this example, this demo, we will have a look at the um, level three. Let me see. Is that a little bit readable? Yeah. Um, so basically, this is the ASVS project of OWASP. And as you can see, it is a really, really extensive checklist for helping developers doing the verification. So this part only is about authentication verification. So as you can see, there are a lot of um, yeah, uh, security controls items in there. It's like, so let's say 15. Then you get the next section. It's about session management, how to do proper session management. I mean, if you would miss or not do one of those, your whole session management design is flawed. If you forget to set, for example, the hot pay only or the secure flag on your cookie, on your session cookie, you can do all this stuff, and I still, or an attacker can still expo exploit it and, you know, beat the whole purpose of it. Um, so, access control, malicious input handling, crypto, the error handling and logging, data protection, communication security, the HTTP protocol security, malicious controls, business logic, and false resources. All those checks are helping, you know, to do the verification uh, for the, de uh, the developer. So how would a developer use this? Basically, it is a, an, an expert system. So. It is basically using this uh, security controls as a question. And if the developer says, well, yeah, I thought of it, I checked it, I do it by this, it's all good. He can select, yes, I'm good. Um, if he comes to an item and he didn't implement it, uh, verify all password fields do not echo the user password when it's entered. So in this case, he's like, oh, shit, yeah, I'm sending the password through an email. It's like, oh, yeah, then no, you didn't correctly implement this security control, so you leave it on no. Um, we also have the information box. It gives some more context about the, the checklist you're uh, verifying. So again, to help him understand him better what is uh, required. Um, basically, the developer will do and fill in the whole checklist, then save the checklist. And what the security knowledge framework has done now he has correlated all the items that were selected as a no and correlated those to, again, knowledge base items to help the uh, developer, making him aware, hey, you didn't implement this security control, so what is the impact? What can an attacker do? What are the attack factors? So, for example, the first one, verify all passwords, do not echo the password when it's used is entered. So, prevent password leaking. That is the security knowledge base item this security control is correlated to. So again, you get a description of what is possible for an attacker, 
and again you get a solution on how a developer should approach it. Um, at the, uh, the dots over here, this is determining the level of the ASVS item it's coming from, so you also know if it's a level 1 item or a level 3, like really critical uh, for, for high critical applications. Um, yeah, and basically, again, this, this can be shared, this can be uh, 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 shared among the team and, you know, help the developer, empower him with knowledge. Um, yeah, and, and make it really uh, aware that, that what the possibilities are where you don't implement security controls. Um, so basically, those are the type of uh, uh, core uh, functionality when you're using uh, the security knowledge framework. Uh, what I do personally is the post-development phase, I sit together with the, the, uh, the development team um, and really do like an extreme programming approach, like get them all in the room, uh, put the, uh, the code on the, the beamer on the big screen and really go through each item on the code level and try to, well, I, I try to challenge them. So th did you thought about this or when I do this, did you... And then we go check the code, do the implementation, check all the uh, security uh, controls, and it will take me like an, a day, day and a half to really fill in the level three uh, checklist, right? Because it's that extensive. Um, so that's really, yeah, I, in my uh, experience, it, it creates a lot of synergy. I mean, I learn a lot of those developers. I'm also a developer by heart. So you get this nice interaction of sharing knowledge and, you know, it. it really is uh, nice, it gets a nice atmosphere. Um, so basically that was a little demo of the security knowledge framework. Uh, and now I want to go into the next level. So, you know, having a security knowledge framework of having security requirements, I, that is basically the first step, right, in the whole software development life cycle. Um, so you still have to do manual things in the software development lifecycle. By example, using the security knowledge framework, filling all the questions, right? Uh, but also you want to do code review. If you have critical functionality like a login or a password reset or whatever, you want to do a code review, the four eyes principle. Uh, of course you want to use the, the static analyzer security tooling, right? So the, the yeah, the the bit checkers, and I don't want to know any vendors. But um, so, SOS tooling. Then you have the dynamic version of it. So that is, for example, the OWASP ZAP proxy. That is really a dynamic application security testing tool. It can be run automatically, that's true, but still you have to manually validate all the findings that will pop up. Um, and of course, at the, old, at the end of the whole thing, of the whole security development lifecycle, you want to do a manual pen test by an expert. And why is that? Because those are the experts, right? They can then do advanced stuff, not focusing on cross-site scripting or, you know, the low stuff, but really the advanced edge stuff. So always do a pen test by a really ex an expert. Um, so, of course, we also have a lot of uh, possibilities to automate things. And uh, the things we can automate, uh, we should do, right? So. Um, what, what made my life really uh, easy uh, when developing the whole security knowledge framework is having automation, continuous integration, so we can do deploys whenever we like or multiple times a day and still get the quality of code and, you know, that we want to deliver. So, for example, we use uh, in our software development lifecycle of the OWASP security knowledge framework project itself, we use three types of uh, continuous integration tooling. Uh, the first one is Travis, Coveralls, and Scrutinizer. Um, so Travis is basically a sort of a Jenkins, it's a, a build uh, street, right? You, uh, what happened is you can hook uh, Travis up to your GitHub. When GitHub has a change, it will notify Travis, he will see it, pick up the new code, and try to run it. Uh, run it as in spinning up an instance, putting your code there, and depending on what your uh, Travis uh, file is, it will do build the project, verify if it's still correctly being set up and built, all that stuff. Um, then you have the coveralls. The coveralls is basically, that's happening after the build, after Travis. When Travis is all successful, you don't have any syntax errors, the project is still running and installing, then it's time to do the coveralls. And coveralls is basically uh, getting the metrics from the unit testing, 
and display it in a very nice uh, manner. Um, so the idea is when the developer does a commit and he passes the uh, build on the Travis, but maybe he changed code and then some type of functionality fails. The developer can then see, because it's continuous integrated, after like one and a half minute, that some of the unit tests fail. So the percentage of the, the whole overall metrics drops instantly. So it is a really good feedback visual loop for the developer to see, oh, I, I killed some functionality. So I have to relook at my code and see where I uh, messed up. Um, then the last part is the uh, scrutinizer. And basically, scrutinizer is the code quality uh, checking tool. Um, so what it does is, when the first crevice was successful, when the coveralls, the unit test was successful, then the last part is the scrutinizer. And what this does is, it will analyze the code on quality level. So do you have any dead-end code? Do you have any duplication code? Do you have any really complex if, else, did, then, blah? Uh, that is, you know, adding to complexity, but that's also decreasing the maturity and the quality of your code. So again, with this uh, um, um, continuous integration service, when a developer does a commit and he had created sloppy code or dead end or duplication code, the grade of the project will drop. And well, you know, now we have an eight. So if it goes below the eight, you definitely know and and see the impact of the commit you have done. So. Now I want to uh, also show a little bit about uh, yeah, the, the software development lifecycle and show you uh, um, the different services. So um, in here, this is the, uh, the place where the security knowledge framework is, uh, is uh, placed. Uh, everything is, is in here. Uh, so for example, all the information, the code examples, all that stuff, you can just look it up here click it, it's all in markdown format, so um, if you want or see any bugs, you can really easily modify it and then uh, uh, push it. So for example, let me edit something here. And commit change. So what does now happen is I, I made a, a modification. Um, Travis will notice and pick it up that I uh, did in a, a different, that this is the new code being uh, pushed. And as you can see here, it already picked it up. So Travis now sees, hey, something strange changed there in the GitHub project. I need to revalidate, recheck if everything still works. So this is basically an automatic process that happens every time I do a commit. It also works when somebody's forking this project in their own repo space and will also have all those benefits. It will do the uh, integration on the Travis part. When that's correctly being built, then it will do the unit testing. And when that's done, it will decode quality. And it's all independent of the main branch, right? So um, really cool that everybody then has this uh, support and, and continuous integration. Um, this would normally take about two and a half minutes to rebuild the whole project, set it up, install it, and to see if there's any uh, uh, errors in it. If that went all correctly, it then uh, creates metrics for you know uh, the outcome of the unit testing. So unit testing produce metrics, and those metrics you will see back in here. Um, and again, so it is very obvious if you uh, yeah, forget or break a functionality because the, the, the display in the graphics will immediately show and give you the feedback, hey, something is wrong, go fix. Um, and then, of course, at last, then we have the uh, scrutinizer. And then, as you can see here, it will give you a grade. So if somebody, again, put very bad or you know, good, not good code, you will see immediately that he made a mistake or that he didn't add the right quality of the code. Um, we can have a look at, for, for example, this one. This, this has a, a D. Oh, and it was already gone. Um, but again, so if you would click on the, the uh, grades, you get the feedback of why it is uh, getting this grade. Um, and again, so you have the feedback loop that's very short that really helps the uh, de developer. So um, when I was talking, it now successfully uh, run the whole project, get the setup, 
uh, test it, went all well, no exit code. Then we go to the test uh, phase and we run the test and then we'll uh, see that all the, the unit testing was correctly. Then we push the, um, the metrics to the coveralls, uh, what we're seeing here. And in here, when we refresh it, we will see update, code example, file upload by blah, blah. And we have still the same coverage. So hey, I didn't miss or break any functionality. Um, then over here, same again, we'll do the scan and we'll grade your code. So if you go back to the main project uh, over here, um, you have all those um, project status details. And this gives me in a one instant overview what the status is and the quality is of my project. Um, and when you have a lot of contributors, you really want something like this, right? It also um, yeah, helps, takes away time from the developer so he has more time to do security, right? That's what we want. Um, so again, it's a really short feedback loop that is really uh, yeah, valuable uh, for, for developers. Um, so yeah, I, like I said, uh, we did the whole aviation example, made the comparison. Um, so what would happen if, if, if somebody would say this to the president uh, for his Air Force One airplane? Like, yeah, it's not necessary to change, five is not mandatory, and meh. I mean, come on. So <laughs> uh, I, I think we, we should you know, take lessons from the aviation, work together. If you are experienced, if you have knowledge about security, please help. I mean, we're all in here to you know, make it a better world. It's all win-win for everybody. Um, if you would like to help the security knowledge framework, please do. If you want to help the other OWASP projects where you have a certain type of experience build up, please help. I mean, uh, we are all in it together. I also use the same airplane you're all going to use, and I'm also going to use all the services you're all going to use. I mean, it's all heavily connected right now. And um, this is the moment to step up, or we end up like the airplane that's coming down, right? Um, so yeah, basically, that was uh, uh, my talk. Are there any questions? It was a lot of information, and uh, it's not only about uh, doing security by design, but it's also about the whole uh, process, about the whole software development lifecycle using integration tools. Glenn, what, what areas of the, the security, security framework project do you need help on? Um, well, it, it would be really nice to have more uh, code examples because, um, you know, on the level of the uh, application security verification standard, that's really cool, but it is more a generic way, right? It's just words. And uh, you still can have the awareness that, you know, you have to do something, but on the implementation level, there are so many things that go wrong, and that's also what you show with the OAuth, right? Um, so, yeah. I would like to have more code examples that, that help and guide developers and empower them with the knowledge to really, you know, create secure web applications. So, yeah, if you can write Java, Python, uh, that stuff, please help. If you're really good at, uh, you know, uh, content and, and written it nicely, uh, also step in or help. Um, check the OWASP site. There are tons of really cool projects. Uh, that, that are, you know, adding value. For example, the OWASP dependency check. That is a static analyzer tool that is finding all old CVEs in, in you know, use libraries or whatever. And every time I run that project and, and that tool, I found like 150 vulnerabilities, known CVEs in, you know, current projects. It's like, what? So again, have a, have a look at, at the OWASP site and, and maybe the security knowledge framework and uh, you know, step up and, and help, help us help yourself, right?